You are listening to the Financial Clarity for Doctors podcast by Finity Group, LLC, where we discuss the pertinent financial planning topics facing physicians and other medical professionals. Discussions in this show should not be construed as specific recommendations or investment advice. Always consult with your investment professional before making important investment decisions. Securities offered through Cambridge Investment Research, Inc., a registered broker-dealer, member FINRA SIPC. And now, here are your hosts, Rochelle Vanderzanden and Corey Jana. Welcome to another episode of Financial Clarity for Doctors. I'm Corey Janoff, joined as always by Rochelle Vanderzanden. Hello. And we have a special guest with us today, Owen Chambers. Say hi, Owen. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Yes, Owen is one of our fellow financial advisors at Finity Group, and we asked him to come on board today uh, because one, you'll you'll quickly see I should just fire myself from this podcast and have Owen replace me. Um, he, he's one of the most eloquent speakers I have ever met, and uh, and two, he he's got some some deep knowledge in the realm of of investor or, or, or more so human behavior and, and the implications it has on our finances and our investment decisions. He actually wrote his thesis in college on this subject, and. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of, of some of the Nobel Prize winners like Richard Thaler or Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. Um, some of them have done a lot of pioneering research uh, in this field on uh, what's been coined behavioral economics or behavioral finance. And, and Owen's going to rain some brilliance on us here today on basically what it means to be a human and the inherent biases uh, that we have as humans and sometimes the irrational decisions we're prone to making as a result. So hope I, uh, I didn't set the bar too high for you here, Owen. I love the comparison. I'm a little yeah. afraid. And compared to the Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> early, come early and often. <laughs> All right. But yeah, Rochelle, why don't you kick us off? Sure, yeah. I mean, we all know that there's a lot of very common behavioral mistakes that people make in their lives and in their finances when they're making decisions and things like that. So obviously they have implications. Can you talk a little bit about what some of those are and some of the implications? Like I know loss aversion is one that we're familiar with. Yeah, loss aversion, the, the core concept is that you feel a loss of a set amount roughly twice as sharply as you feel a gain of an equivalent amount. So if I offer you, Rochelle, the chance to win $100, but there's a 50% chance that you're going to lose $100, most people will never take that bet when offered because they're happy with the status quo and they prefer not to introduce the risk that they might lose money. If I offer you the chance to win 200 bucks or a 50% chance to lose $100, At that point, you start to think, well, maybe this is worth my while because I have a significant chance of increasing my well-being relative to what the downside would look like. So at that level, it it drives a lot of irrational behavior from people who are very happy to take the devil that they know in return for avoiding the devil that they don't, even if there's statistically a pretty high probability, the devil that they don't know is not going to be as bad as they might be afraid he would be. Mm -hmm. I know like the devil that we know that we talk about a lot at work is things like inflation. Like that's that's something that we know exists and yet people don't have a huge problem with that because it's like a known factor. Whereas investment risk is a b- really big one for people. Like that's something that really scares people. And inflation can be subject to what's kind of known as framing in that people just assume inflation is always there. It's in the background. I'm aware of this. So I'm free to kind of dismiss that from any calculations I make about future prospects. The fact that I'm aware of it means it won't have an impact on me, which is obviously irrational, but it's the way a lot of people are very comfortable operating. Mm -hmm. Got it. There we go. And yeah, we have a lot of these I want to dive into, but before we go any further, just maybe take a step back, Owen, and tell us, you know, why this subject in particular became of interest to you and, and whatnot. Yeah, I think anyone who's taken enough economics classes of any subgenre begins to realize that so many of these models posit you have these perfectly rational actors. These people who in every situation make the decision which makes the most mathematical sense, which for any of us who have like woken up, walked out of our bedroom and seen people at any point in our lives, we start to understand pretty quickly that's not how it tends to go in most cases. 
Folks are driven by a lot of emotions. They're very reactive in some circumstances. So the models that say you're not going to take what's happened previously into account, you're just going to take a perfectly facing forward view of what's coming up and make your decisions that way, fundamentally there's a really significant flaw that we have to reckon with before we can take those models seriously as a, a predictive tool for the real world. So one of the things that I was most interested in is just a practical assessment of how far from that perfectly rational actor is the average investor or fundamentally the average person, and in what ways does that discrepancy tend to make itself the most pronounced? Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Um, you know, like you said, economic models assume that humans will always make the most optimal decision for themselves and they know what's best for themselves. But everyone listening here knows there have been times where you haven't made the most optimal decision for yourself, sometimes even intentionally for and knowing that it wasn't the most optimal for, for one reason or another. So uh, this can can have some far reaching implications on your, your finances, your investments and just your overall life. Um, so, uh, you know, I think being, just being aware of, of some of these things, um, can, can be, help you. Um, you know, we can't change the fact that we're human. We got to live with this stuff. We can't get rid of the, the inherent biases that we have, but just knowing that they exist, I think can help people navigate the world a little bit better. Um, and so, yeah, Rochelle, you mentioned loss aversion. That's a big one. People, you know, hate losing money. Um, you know, everyone hates losing money, but the pain of losing is about twice as, as severe as the happiness that you gain from winning. Um, and what about one, another one of those biases, anchoring effect? Can you talk about what that is and, and, and its implications for people? Yeah, so anchoring effect is the idea that you set a target and then that target becomes the bar for success or failure and you're unable to disassociate yourself from that, even in situations where it would be more to your benefit to take a broader reaching view of what success or failure really looks like. So this is one actually where I, I have an anecdote that was shared with me by one of the people who helped me develop my thesis, who's actually my uncle, a guy named Bruce Judd, who works for a very successful consulting firm that helps businesses make strategic decisions. So his firm was working with a company that had had several projects in a row that had not been as successful as they thought they would be coming out of the gate. So his firm modeled a project that the company was about to begin working on, and what they found was that their estimates for even the very lowest end of what success might look like were a lot more optimistic than the ones the manager spearheading that project had brought to the table for the company. So their question for the manager was, why are your estimates around your own project so pessimistic? Don't you think you're sort of shooting yourself in the foot when it comes to your future prospects for success? And the manager's explanation was simply enough. If I give my supervisors estimates like the ones you guys have provided, the low end of that becomes the bar for success. If I can't measure up to it, they're going to deem me a failure and give me responsibility. I also know that somewhere during this project, they're going to cut my funding, which is an assumption you have not taken into your model. So I now have this unreasonably high bar given the resources I've been provided to try and meet it with. There's no way I'm going to be successful. And even if I have a project that in isolation would be really beneficial for the firm, they're going to make it look bad on me when they assess how this went at the end of the process. So if I undershoot dramatically right now, that will anchor management's philosophy around that tenant, which is one I know I can still meet even after my funding is inevitably cut mid-project. So it's, it's the classic idea of under-promising and over-delivering. That's a way that you can make it work to your benefit. The problem for a lot of investors is that we don't take that rational and input to try and make ourselves happy or successful at the end of the process. The way that a lot of consumer investors anchor is to a major index. I think one we've probably all seen over the last several years is the S&P 500 as a performance-based anchor for stock investments. It has been essentially the top performing index year in and year out for several years here. So if you say, if my performance is not as good at the S&P 500, I'm a failure of an investor, you're setting yourself up to be a failure. Because if you have a diversified portfolio, you'll never match the top performing index, even if you always do better than the bottom performing few. So try and anchor yourself to just what will make you successful. We talk a lot about the rate of return it takes a client to get to retirement on schedule. If you anchor yourself to that performance level rather than matching the top index in any given year, you'll do just as well over time and you'll probably feel a lot better about it. 
And our mind is, I mean, it plays tricks on us and we can trick our mind too. I think some of the studies that have shown the power of anchoring effect, you know, they'll, they'll, you know, take a group of people and say, all right, write down the last four digits of your social security number. And everyone writes it down on a piece of paper. And then the next question is estimate the number of countries in the United Nations. And inevitably <laughs> people who have, you know, social the last four uh, higher digits, you know, it's like 9,000, you know, 9384 <laughs> versus someone who's 1162. The person whose social starts with a nine is going to estimate a higher number of countries than the person whose social starts with a one. And, it, you know, no rhyme or reason other than our brain anchored to that higher number or that lower number. And then it set the stage for everything else that's that's come after that. Very awkward. Yeah. <laughs> Very much so. In that example, it seems like you're just saying people with lower last four digits are generally smarter than people with higher. <laughs> <laughs> One other thing I was thinking about when Corey was talking, he was saying that like we walk outside, we know we have biases, blah, blah, blah. But I think there is also the fact that we overestimate our own abilities. And I know that that's, that's one of the ones that we talk about a lot is just that like we have a sense that we can make good decisions and we can be other people. What was that called, Owen? And what can you talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, so there are there are a couple we could kind of construe that way, just depending okay. on time frame to what's happened. So I'd say the two that are probably the most relevant would be self attribution bias and hindsight bias. Self attribution bias is the idea that when something good happens, you really like to give yourself credit for it and say, "I'm the one who made this happen." And when something bad happens, you're a little bit less likely to do so. You say, well, this is due to circumstances outside of my control. No one could reasonably have predicted or mitigated these consequences. I did the best I could with the information provided. Hindsight bias is really the idea of just doing the same thing after it's done and has already happened. You look back and say, well, of course I knew that thing was going to happen. So a lot of people at this point in the year are saying, Early in January, I had a very strong hunch that coronavirus was going to become a real thing and have a very sharp impact on the stock market. And sure, I might not have adjusted my portfolio in February to protect for the correction, but that's just because I was getting bad advice from people who were telling me to stay calm. If I had indulged in my own instinct, I would have perfectly sold out of the stock market in early March and bought back into it right about the 25th. Even for professionals, it's easy to get trapped up a little bit in that. I think cognitive dissonance definitely plays a role. We like to uh, sort of sell ourselves as the people who are immune to these biases. We can never feel that way because we're aware. I think more materially that the advantage is that we are aware these things exist, and we can spot check our own decisions and actions more accurately along the way for those patterns showing up. Absolutely. Corey, we lost you a little bit. Talk a little bit more about that implication of cognitive dissonance and what that is. I think that's an important one. Yeah, so it's, it's the idea that you hold one belief or understanding. You know something is true, and what, yet when you act in ways that that frames as completely irrational, you don't have a problem with it because you're very comfortable excusing your own actions. So it's people who know, I am supposed to stay the course if I am a very long-term investor who is watching the market drop sharp, sharply. I have been told this, I understand this, I have seen the literature that if I remain invested in my portfolio, I will do better than someone who attempts to panic sell the stop of bleeding from getting worse. And then at the same time, they watch the market drop 20% in a couple of weeks and they go, okay, well clearly this is the end of days, it's time for me to get out. They sell their portfolio to cash and then they miss the ride back up. They knew it was the wrong thing to do. If you'd asked them for an explanation academically before they did it, they would explain to you it was the wrong thing to do. But then because of the way they were feeling in that moment, they were very sure this was the one exception to the rule and they will happily go all the way off their own script just to be a little bit more comfortable for a brief period. And there's so many times when you just, <laughs> you're just trying to make yourself feel more comfortable, but the, the consequences are, are huge and can be huge. It's a very difficult thing to, to watch something you've worked hard for seemingly slipping through your grasp and understand the right thing to do is essentially nothing and stick to that idea. Absolutely. I feel like we've covered a lot of these different um, topics a little bit or these different biases that people have. One thing that I'm not really familiar with is recency bias. Is that one? What is that one? Yeah, it's it's really, it's kind of the idea of you taking the thing that has happened most recently and you say, this is what's going to continue to happen. 
So if you get a series of outputs, let's just say we're rolling a, a dice, five, a die five times randomly, and we get a six, a four, a three, a two, a one, and we say, okay, well, the last one was one, and they ask us, what's your prediction for the way the die is going to come out next? And we say, well, obviously, it was going to be a one. That was the last number came up as. And that's something that obviously shows up in the market quite a bit. You look at what last year's top performers were, and you say, well, I don't think all the momentum that got them through 2019 has just ended. Those are probably the same positions I'd like to be invested in for 2020. So that can lead to a lot of chasing returns for investors. They see something do well and they want a piece of it, and they don't take a step back and think, is this still a good value for me in light of the fact that it's already performed best over the last year? You know, there's a truly random output like a die where obviously what number you rolled last has no bearing on what number you roll going forward, and any one of the six is just as good a guess. But with stocks, a lot of the time, the fact is if a position has appreciated 50% in the last year, it might be a little bit overvalued. So maybe that's not one we necessarily want to throw a lot of our money into the next year if we don't have a specific reason to think it's still in a favorable position. This is probably the most common one that I come across with people who will say, hey, how about we invest in this area? It was up 40% in the last year. Um, you know, why? And just like you said, there's no guarantee that moving forward, and we've all heard it, past performance doesn't equal future results, but our brains are hardwired to think, oh, if you know, the, the trajectory will continue. It's kind of like if you get sunshine three days in a row without looking at the weather report, you're probably going to assume it's going to be sunny tomorrow. Um, but that isn't necessarily the case. So I feel like I see that come up a lot in people's employer plans too, because you have a list of, you know, maybe 30 mutual funds. And one of the things that they give you as a piece of information is performance. You know, like there's like expense ratio, which people might not even know what it means, but then they look at performance and they look at percentages and it's like, well, that one looks really good. Let's do that one. Um, yeah. And I, I think it's really hard for people to to make informed decisions when they're not quite sure what they're looking at and what it means. I think we've all seen that one a lot over the last probably decade or so since we came out of 08. You know, domestic stocks have so consistently been on the upper end of performance relative to foreign positions. It's, it's become tough to convince even a lot of people who've done some research and understand some of the tenets of diversification. There is still value to holding these foreign assets, even though it's been a little while while they've trailed the domestic market. You know, it's a lot easier for folks to say the S&P 500 has been a great one for the last five years, isn't it simplest for us just to go that direction? Now, one of these uh, biases I think most people probably heard of is confirmation bias, but can you elaborate a little bit on that one and why it's important? Yeah, it's the idea that we see what we want to see when a set of data is provided to us. We're not looking at all the facets of it. We're just looking for one thing that supports the theory that we already have and running with that is the most important piece of information for us to operate on. So if, if someone was trying to take that coronavirus at the end of days standpoint, they would say, well, March 23rd, the average diversified portfolio was down 30 to 35 percent on the year for an aggressive investor. Coronavirus is the end of days. And they don't look now. Well, May was one of the best months in recent stock market history. We're not down all that much more than usual for a year to date standpoint. It's hard to look at the data that says something you don't want to see, particularly when there's already been a corresponding piece of information provided that supports your viewpoint. Very few people have a mature enough growth mindset to go into any discussion being really comfortable, let alone seeking out the idea of being wrong. We'd all like to be right more often than we're not, and it's easy to interpret a set of data in a way that construes you as being so. And this extends beyond just investing. I mean, just take a look at where you get your news from. Do you watch Fox News or do you watch CNN? My guess is the news station you prefer is the one that supports your political ideologies. And you want to see the facts that confirm your beliefs and not go against your beliefs. It's just, you're human. There's nothing wrong with that. It just means you're human. Absolutely. It's all social science. I mean, and I think that goes back a lot to those rational actor thoughts, too, is that even in political science and areas like that, we assume that people are rational actors. And we know that that's not true all the time. And it's true with investing, too. 
even in the really personal situations, you know, if you have an argument with your spouse, you'll ask friends, you know, here's the argument that we were having. Whose side are you on? And if you ask <laughs> three friends and two of them says, oh, and your, your girlfriend was right. You were very wrong about this. You should apologize. And one friend says, you were 100 percent on board. Like, why is she disagreeing with you in this situation? I'm going to take that one person who said I'm right and hold them up like they are 100% rock solid evidence. I was on the right side of that discussion. The two people who told me I was 100% wrong, I've forgotten about them before they even finished their sentence. <laughs> Fortunately, See, you that plays a lot into that one too. <laughs> you probably learned <laughs> how, no matter about it. If you're a guy, you're probably talking to a guy about it. <laughs> <laughs> Confirmation bias in play. That's my Fox News. And no matter how many of your friends you get to confirm that you're right, you're you're still not winning the argument. It's true. It's true. I would have been better off just taking the first person's advice and ending it there. There you go. What about uh, last one of these biases before we talk a little bit more about some of these implications? Um, illusion of control. Talk about that one a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's simply, I mean, that one is sort of indicative of itself because it sounds like what it is. It's the idea that we have control over stuff that we clearly do not, that our decisions made things happen even when we had no bearing on them. It can be as simple as the idea that you think a stock is positioned to outperform, you buy a little bit of it, and suddenly it takes off, and you think, I made that happen. You know, my prediction drove people. I was telling everyone at work around this, so everyone at work must have bought shares too. And even if you told everybody at work about it, they all believed you and they all put all of their net worth into that asset, all that money combined is not enough to make a difference in the price of that stock. You just happen to get into it at the right time. None of us can really claim to have that much control over what the market's going to do from an individual stock to a broad-based mutual fund. It's happening outside of the scope of our control, even outside of the scope of the control of many of the institutional actors who maybe more fairly have fallen into a belief that they can shift the direction of the market dynamic. If you're the Fed, maybe. But. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's one example where maybe. And even then, I'd say Jerome Powell has probably been disillusioned of his sense of control at this juncture as he's realized monetary policy is not a perfectly accurate tool for control of the economy. That is super inconvenient. And again, that's why he has to really set a nice low anchor for his performance so that nobody gets too angry if moving the interest rate down a little bit doesn't immediately correct an adverse dynamic in the stock market. Absolutely. Okay, different topic a little bit. <laughs> so we've talked about loss aversion already and how that affects individuals when they're making decisions, but how does that play into like group dynamics and people are making decisions as a group? Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting question because people have explored this from a couple of different angles. So one that has been explored pretty thoroughly is what if you take one person and you turn them into two? Essentially, what if you have a couple making this decision instead of just one individual? And what's been found is that there is generally a sense of responsibility to the less, to the individual who is less comfortable with risk in that pairing. So the lower, the upper bound rather for risk tolerance tends to become what that lower risk tolerance individual is comfortable with. The person who thinks we should really roll the dice in this situation starts to feel guilty when they look over to their side and see that the other person is absolutely sweating bullets with the concept they're pretty comfortable. In a larger scale setting, what has been found is that typically risk tolerance is somewhat higher than the average of the group. People can talk themselves into making decisions that are a little bit riskier if rational, if there are more people there to look at the number. I think that classic example of, you know, you have a 50-50 proposition to win 200 bucks or lose 100. It's tough for us by ourselves to be okay with losing the $100. But if you have five other people looking at you who you know are going to look sideways, if you say you don't want that bet because they understand it to be positive more often than not, you're going to start to conform to what you understand is a rational act, even if it's not one you're 100% comfortable with. And I think that's it's a piece of the value proposition for people like us because we are the third person in that decision who can inject a little bit of objectivity, hopefully, into the way that we go about making it. Awesome. And I think yeah. there's a lot of ways to move into real life examples here. But one thing I was thinking about is just the idea of sunk costs in the economy as a whole. But also you can think about that in your personal life. So let's say you have a car and you pumped a whole bunch of money into it 
and now you're getting to the point where you really don't want to pump any more money into it because you've already put so much money into it. It's just not worth it anymore. So how does that affect how people make decisions and how possibly they're making poor decisions or maybe not the best decision because of things that have already happened? Yeah, we, we get attached pretty easily. The car example is one that maybe hurts a little bit too much for me personally because I've been guilty of this at times. The idea that, you know, I know I've done three different projects. They've averaged $1,000 per. I've spent three grand over the last year and a half on a car that is maybe worth five on a good day. And yet I still have something else come up that's going to require me to spend another $1,000. It's 20% of the car's price. The car is clearly showing me a trend of declining health. But I conform to this idea, well, if I spend $1,000 one more time and I don't have any problem right now, no problem is going to come up again in the future. So this is the one that will finally fix this for me, and I do it, whereas the mechanic would happily tell me if I asked him, look, at this point, your best bet is to sell this car. You're going to have another problem a year from now, even if you fix this one. We'd love to keep making money off of you forever, but this is not a great idea from their perspective. If you buy an investment that you think is a really great idea and then it has a couple of years of very poor performance, you start to think, well, it's just a better value now than it was previously. Of course, I'm still right. This was a great idea to invest in. So if I can get better value, I'll throw a thousand dollars more into it, even though that company or that fund is showing a long term trend of declining performance with no immediate reason for you to think that's going to turn itself around. Yeah, you, we inherently want to get our money's worth after we spend money, so we're hesitant to detach from something. Like a, a an easy example would be if you buy tickets to a concert, you've already spent that money, you're not getting it back. And the afternoon of the concert, you come down with a really bad headache, and you know you're just going to be miserable if you go into a loud stadium with blaring music, uh, but you're likely going to still drag yourself to the concert because you already paid for it and you want to get your money's worth even though it's going to make you less happy by going than if you just stayed home and gave away the tickets. Hopefully you didn't spend an amount that's going to force you into bankruptcy on the concert tickets because then I'd understand really wanting to see the show. But for most of us where you can't afford to just say goodbye, in those situations, it's, it's really fair to think about solely your money moving forward and try and detach yourself as best you can from what you've already sunk into whatever you have in your pocket. How have you seen these kinds of things affect clients over years? Like worst, best case scenarios, when the market's doing really well, how do you see clients react, either poorly or, or not? Yeah, when the market's doing well, it's hard not to get excited, right? You watch that stuff go up and, and you start thinking, well, I have to get a piece of this. And for some investors, and this is a theme I've referenced a couple of times already over the last few years, that's led to performance chasing in domestic equity rather than in foreign equity. They've seen U.S. stocks perform very well, so they could assume that's going to continue happening and they dump into that. And when you're right, whether it's by happenstance or because you understand a larger dynamic, that tends to have pretty positive impact on your performance right up until the point that it doesn't, which in that particular example, we really haven't realized just yet. In negative situations, when things aren't going well, it can lead to basically the same effect, having the opposite impact because you keep throwing money at the thing that you're convinced at some point is going to turn itself around, even though it never does. You just watch that value get lower and lower as you talk yourself more and more into this being a good price point for you to make entry on. So hopefully people can try to just keep themselves a little bit more even keel. This is something that I talk with my clients a lot about in terms of how we're going to monitor a portfolio and adjust it over time is just try and be robotic. Unless you understand that fundamentally something has changed about your goals of the market as a whole and you have a really solid reason to think so, typically it doesn't behoove you to make a big shift in strategy towards something that's done well. You just want to rebalance yourself back to a target. You want to get rid of some of the stuff that's done well, buy up some stuff that hasn't done as well, and force yourself to sell high and buy low over time. It's just difficult to do that in the moment because no one wants to turn away from the thing that has momentum going to really feel like it positions them well for success. We lost you again. Corey, I don't think we have you. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having audio difficulties today, one of those mornings. Um, how do you coach your your clients to to deal with that market volatility and be prepared for it? Because we know it's inevitable um, in both you know, both good times and bad. So how do, how do you help people navigate those waters? 
I think the biggest thing, especially for a lot of our younger clients, is to frame significance to help people understand, look, just because something is happening today does not mean it's going to have a significant impact on what things look like for you 30 years in the future. Typically about five years is how long it's historically taken for the market to recover from a major correction. So if you're an investor with 30 years before you're going to pull money out of the account we're talking about, what happens today hopefully won't have a big bearing on you unless we allow it to make us guilty of a short-term irrational decision. So one of the things that we reference a lot when it comes to intra-year volatility is the fact that over the last 20 years or so, even though the S&P 500 has returned a positive figure very roughly two-thirds of the time at a year-end basis, within the average year, we see a correction of about 14% from where we were earlier in the year. That's a number that J.P. Morgan cites a lot in their research, which means that if you are down 10% at some point from where you were earlier in the year, that can feel like a big shift and one that we need to take some proactive and corrective action against, but it, that's really exactly what we should expect to happen in an average year. We shouldn't let that drive a big shift in our strategy because it's just not significant enough to impact our long-term prospects. For the folks who are closer to needing to pull money out of an investment account where that short-term volatility is no longer something we can so comfortably ignore, it really does have prospects to drive a long-term shift in our expectations, we just need to position ourselves better not to be as impacted by it. While none of us are capable really of getting into a real investment strategy that guarantees there won't be loss, we can definitely mitigate that by having a more conservative profile if we understand that we're on a time horizon where short-term volatility can have a bigger impact on us. And I like how you mentioned um, when we see our portfolio go down, we feel like we need to act and do something. It gets back to that illusion of control. We feel like we have control over the outcome and can affect and impact the outcome when in reality, we don't have as much control as we may think. So you know, rather than trying to, to react in real time, it's, it's the optimal decision would be to, to have a plan in place and be prepared for those events and have a, you know, a plan for what you're going to do during those times, whether it's stay the course, whether it's rebalance, whether it's, you know, whatever it is, just have a plan ahead of time so you're not thinking on the fly and potentially making harmful decisions to your overall wealth. And to that point, Corey, this is a question that I actually have for both of you. Can you think of the last time that a client saw an investment in their portfolio doing very, very well and asked if they needed to take some corrective or some adjustment action against that? Have you ever heard of someone saying, the stock I bought is going gangbusters, is it about time for me to trim the position without it being recommended? Rare. Um, hard to think of a, an event or a time off the top of my head. Usually it's, this one's doing well, let's buy more. Yeah. Um, you know, we're going to continue that streak. Uh, I think, you know, there have been a, occasional scenarios where um, clients have said, hey, we had a good run, let's pare back the risk a little bit. Um, and, and for those folks, they're usually older folks who are nearing retirement and they have a large enough nest egg, we don't need to take on as much risk. Um, but usually it happens after the fact, like this coronavirus example in when stuff was hitting the fan and the market started to go down, people were saying, ooh, I should probably de-risk now to prevent further losses rather than at the end of 2019 after one of the best years ever in the stock market. I didn't get anyone on December 31st saying, hey, you know, we had a good run, we should probably you know, take some of the risk off the table and invest more conservatively moving forward because we're probably not going to see this same performance in 2020. That conversation, I, I don't recall anyone bringing up. And I do think that that becomes more stark when you're looking at like equity positions or single stocks as opposed to mutual funds. Because mutual funds, like I, I don't know that a lot of people look at the performance of different mutual funds in their portfolios in detail, like maybe a little bit, but not that much. But they might notice that they have Amazon or Netflix in their portfolio and that position has just gone crazy over the last few years. Like I feel like that's more common, but you're right. I mean, I don't I don't know that I recall the client <laughs> specifically reaching out to me and saying, and I, hey, we should trim this position. I think that's a, a really good point, Rochelle, because the individual stock, I think, is easier to succumb to confirmation bias with because there's more of a news cycle around it. Very rarely does Bloomberg or Market Watch or even the New York Times write an article about the performance of a mutual fund, right? That just doesn't happen. 
However, if a stock, like an individual U.S. large name, like a Netflix or an Amazon, is doing very, very well, a lot of the publications that amateur investors like to read tout those as good positions because they have done so well. So it's easy to see that piece of data that supports a conclusion you already wanted to draw and go, that's right, MarketWatch.com. I did make a great investment decision six months ago. It's time to go back to the well on that. Thanks for reminding me how great I am. Yeah. Yeah. I've definitely had conversations with clients a few times about specific stock positions where it's like, this has done really well. Maybe we just trim it a little bit. <laughs> like, I'm not going to tell you to sell it all because I know you don't want to, but maybe we just <laughs> just cut it back a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. It's all good I stuff. I feel like we talked a little bit about like people nearing retirement and how like insulating themselves mm -hmm. from volatility is really important. Um, because obviously that's much scarier when you're getting to the point where you need your money. Do you have any specific recommendations for like how people do that? Like how do you limit like the volatility that you're exposed to as an investor that's closing to need or closer to needing your money? Yeah, it, hopefully it'll be a gradual process. The way that I, I think it's scariest to think of it is the people who look at it as a switch that gets flipped sometime around when you expect to retire, you go from the portfolio that you had as a very young person 30 years away, from that directly to a portfolio that's something approaching 100% fixed income because you're really trying to control that downside risk now that you view yourself as being there, which I, I think is guilty of two sins. The first one being we don't recognize the chance that as we get close to retirement but we're not quite there, the market turns south right in that window, which for many people will be a prolonged period, somewhere between five and seven years, where they're right on the cusp of being ready but they're not quite there yet. And if you leave yourself very aggressively allocated, it's a huge problem. For someone who was in a 9 to 10 portfolio in January who expected their retirement to start this June, those expectations have shifted, right? Because they can't afford the same lifestyle anymore based on what happened because they hadn't protected themselves soon enough. At the same time, it's possible to take that correction too early. If you think you're ready for retirement and you shift initially into that 100% fixed income portfolio, the signal that you're sending me is you don't expect your retirement to last very long. That's kind of a depressing signal for how long you expect to be around now that you've stopped working full time. I'm hoping that by the time you flip the switch at that juncture, you've got 20 to maybe 40 more years of life, if not even more, that we're trying to plan for. So it's important to leave some degree of your portfolio still exposed to some risk so it can participate in higher returning assets over long periods of time. And you can pace the rising cost of living and still be able to afford your retirement lifestyle at the end rather than just really live a, live a lavish lifestyle for the first couple of years you're away from work and then find yourself in trouble when you haven't been able to maintain a return profile sufficient to allow you to keep withdrawing at the same rate. So ideally, just a gradual glide path to the point where you're in a relatively balanced allocation when retirement's about to start. And of course, there's no guarantee that those historically higher performing assets will deliver higher performance in the long run. But, uh, you know, when we're, we're talking about inflation and dealing with cost of living over time, you've got to give yourself a chance of growth. Um, so, you know, we've we got to give ourselves that possibility. Otherwise, we're basically volunteering ourselves to, to have a diminishing lifestyle uh, or quality of life. Now, I know we've been going for a little while now to, to kind of wrap things up. You know, we're all humans. We have these biases, whether we care to admit them or not. If you don't feel even the slightest bit of anxiety when your portfolio drops significantly, you're you're not a human, you're a robot. Everyone, again, whether they're willing to admit it, gets a little bit of, uh, of, of a wrench in their stomach when they see, especially with larger portfolio balances, see a six-figure or even seven-figure drop in value. Um, but, but knowing that these biases exist and we can't change them or get rid of them, we can only be aware of them. What are some tips that you have for how people can best cope with themselves and optimally manage their decision making? Yeah, one thing is to set a routine. I think that if you force yourself to have a schedule for when and to what degree you are going to rebalance your portfolio, it's much easier to avoid making those judgment or bias-based mistakes when it comes time to adjust things. If you have a target set and you know you're going to rebalance to it two or four times a year, you just go in and do that. And as a, as a factor 
of doing that on a routine schedule, you inevitably force yourself to sell things that have done well and buy things that haven't done as well, which is generally the idea behind buying low and selling high. If, on the other hand, you allow yourself just to make your judgment about when you'll do that, usually it's because there's been some big news item that comes in that is already tilting your focus and leading you in the direction of making an irrational decision. So we don't want to let the news control when we make those decisions because it's almost impossible for us to make them right, right on the heels of receiving a big new piece of information that we just can't interpret correctly or in context. I think another thing is just having someone involved who has a different perspective on what's going on. Obviously, you know, having some professional oversight, even for people who are interested in taking control of the direction of their own portfolios, it can help. Well, I think just like Corey said, if you watch a balance go down, it hurts all of us a little bit. It doesn't impact a professional who's overseeing your portfolio the same way at that gut emotional level to watch money they're managing drop in value. It's still a problem. None of us ever like seeing a client's portfolio decline. It's the exact opposite of what we're after. But when it happens, I think by the merit of understanding the biases we're subject to and a little bit of experience dealing with that variety of market condition, more often than not, we can take a forward-facing stance on this and think what can we do to mitigate circumstances and control things going forward rather than trying to react to what's just happened and shift ourselves into a position that would protect us from the event that's already occurred rather than what we expect to be coming next. And just reading on this information for a lot of people, I think, can be very valuable. You know, there's a variety of layman-oriented literature out there to help people understand how these decisions can become a problem over time. Vanguard has actually written a lot to these variety of topics repeatedly. If you understand the thought traps that you can fall into, it's a little bit easier to catch yourself doing them when it actually happens. It's certainly not a panacea, the idea that if you understand all these different things, you'll just know exactly when you're guilty of one and stop. But if you understand the problems that you can see come up repeatedly, it's a lot easier to recognize those patterns in your own behavior and at least take some steps to not do them as frequently. Yep. And I think one thing to understand is that, you know, we have these average rates of return that we're hoping to get, um, but we also have the average rates of return that investors actually get. And often it's much, much lower. And it's because of all of these reasons, mostly. It's not because of bad investment decisions. A lot of times it's because we make emotional decisions. So if we can strip some of that out, have a little bit of an understanding of ourselves and a little bit of oversight from someone else that's less emotionally attached to our money, I think that can be really helpful. Boom. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Owen. I'd like to have you back again sometime. It's been my pleasure. Absolutely, whenever you guys can tolerate it again. <laughs> All right, have a good one. We'd love to hear your feedback and suggestions for future topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing podcast at thefinitygroup.com or by following Finity Group on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube at Finity Group LLC. You can follow me on Twitter at Corey Janoff CFP. Instagram at Corey Janoff or on LinkedIn under my name, Corey Janoff. You can follow me on Twitter at Rochelle Finance or on Instagram, Vanderzanden Rochelle or on LinkedIn under my name, Rochelle Vanderzanden. Check out all of the podcast episodes on the affinitygroup.com slash podcast on our Affinity Group YouTube channel or your favorite podcast app. And don't forget to check out our Financial Clarity blog at thefinitygroup.com slash blog. Thanks for listening to this episode of Financial Clarity for Doctors by Finity Group LLC.